And I wanted you to hold off on question number 14 from um, the 3 7 stuff. I think they kind of assumed you knew this knowledge. So read it carefully enough. <laughs> Okay, so this we discussed already a little bit. The cost of producing X ounces of gold <coughs> from a new gold mine is C equals F of X dollars. Dang, it's right next to you. you have to grab a new one. Um, what is the meaning of the derivative? So in this case, C prime of X or F prime of X, if I wrote it with the other notation, it'd be D, C, D, X. And I think the most helpful thing for figuring out what these things mean is looking at that notation and figuring out the units. So C is cost, right? So that's in dollars. What is X measured in? Ounces. So this is really dollars per ounce. So it's telling you how the cost is changing in dollars per ounce. Which we discussed that already, right? We had that exact question elsewhere. Okay, another one, the number of bacteria after T hours in a controlled laboratory is N equals F of T. This should say what is the meaning of F prime of T? So N prime or F prime, will that be DN DT or DT DN? DN DT. <coughs> what is the meaning of the N? N is the, go ahead. Bacteria. Number of bacteria. And then over, what's the units of the denominator? hours. So what does that tell <coughs> you about the population of bacteria? How it's changing. Like is it increasing or decreasing? This tells us how the population size of bacteria is changing. If that were a positive number, the number of bacteria that you have is increasing. If it's negative, the number you have is decreasing. You could think like, you know, flu epidemic. First they increase, and then people can become immune, and then it decreases, right? Hopefully. Hopeful, hopefully, unless it's 1918 and it's pandemic flu. In that case, you know, we're all screwed. Yes. Okay. So, so far, when we did implicit differentiation, this is just kind of a little bit of a review, if we had x squared plus y squared equals 10. We took the derivative of both sides. And we said, OK, 2x plus 2y dy dx equals 0, right? We didn't add anything with that term because that would have been dx dx and dx dx is 1. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take this function, but we're going to differentiate it with respect to a variable that isn't there. So we're going to differentiate it with respect to time. So we're going to say take d dt of y, and that's equal to d dt of x squared plus 2x cubed. So now dx is in there? Now you'll have dx dt's in there. Yep, so it's the same as the implicit differentiation, except for now you need one of those things every single time. <coughs> Say that again? That is x to the fourth. Yes, it is. Look, it's x to the fourth now. Is it going to be like... Let me show you what it will be, and then tell me... So let me show you what it is, and then tell me if that makes sense. Okay, so the derivative of y will be 1. So you'd have 1 dy dt, okay, equals... 4x cubed dx dt plus 6x squared dx dt. Is that what you were expecting? Uh, I, I didn't see the other one over there. Okay. I was looking at the, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. And so dy dt is how fast y is changing with respect to time, maybe like per second, per hour, per something. And dx dt is how fast x is changing. 
Uh -huh. And then you know you're given the fact that dx dt is 7. And you want to find dy dt at the specific instance when x is 1. Because dy dt might change depending upon what that x is. It might be bigger for different x's. Like if you think about your bacteria population, it grows faster at different times. Does that make sense? Its rate of growth is not always the same. So now you just take that equation you have and you input the information. You don't know dy dt, that's the thing you want to find. It'll be 4 <coughs> times 1 cubed times 7 plus 6 times 1 squared times 7. So D, well, they, gave us a DXDT, they gave you DXDT, and if they hadn't given you DXDT, you couldn't do anything else with this. Because okay. it's not like you can solve, you could, if you solve for DXDT, you're going to have DYDTs in your answer. If you solve for DYDT, you're going to have DXDTs in your answer. So these will always be situations where you're given something about the rate of change of one of the variables. And it's often going to be implied in some kind of context, like the ripple is increasing at a rate of blah means the radius is increasing at a rate of something. That's what that question was on your homework. So I think that's 28 plus 42? 70. 70, yep. So dy dt is equal to 70. And that specifically is at the time when x is 1. Right, that was only at that. If, I, if x had been 2, that would have been a different answer, right? Okay. Say that again. Like before they took the derivative, yeah. T isn't really zero. T is just another additional variable that isn't present anywhere in the equation. Yeah. Which seems a little bit strange, but it's kind of like if you had you did differentiation on something and the variable you differentiate with respect to just isn't there. <coughs> Which is the other examples we had, the variable is actually there in the equation, but these they won't be. But it is that implicit differentiation idea just with two variables instead of one, that's all. Okay? Now, most of the you're going to see aren't going to be quite like that, they're going to be physical situations. And the hardest thing with all of these questions is coming up with the equation in the first place that describes the thing that you're being, like, you're looking at. And they're all a bit different because they're life and life's a bit like, you know, not uber clean and neat like most math problems are. I mean, these are easier than real, real life problems. These are like fake real life problems. Okay, so a pebble dropped into a calm pond and it caused ripples to form in the, in the form of circles and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? The radius of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. When the radius is four feet, at what rate is the area of the disturbed water changing? So this last question here, radius, area. So the things you're working with are radius and area. And I'm not sure the best way to do this, but I think the thing you should start with, you're going to be find the rates you're given. And then find the rate you want. <clears throat> okay. So the sentence that says the radius of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. The foot <coughs> per second tells you that it's a rate. So what that is saying is dr dt is equal to 1 foot per second. Does that make sense? It's how fast the radius, change in radius over change in time. Does that make sense? Okay, what do they want you to find? <coughs> mm -hmm. So how fast the area is changing. So they want you to find dA dt equals don't know. What are dA dt's units going to be? Square feet. Uh-huh, square feet per second, because the units of the area would be something squared, right? And since the radius is measured in feet for other stuff, that will also be feet. 
and to see how we were told that the one thing was in feet per second, so the other one, once we compute, is going to be in feet per second. Okay, so first step, figure out what rates you're given, what rates you want to find. Kind of like we were given dy dt equals something, right? Okay, step two is make an equation. I mean, like, and I don't mean make up whatever you want. I mean, I mean, make up an equation that relates the variables together somehow. So how could you relate together area and radius? <coughs> it's a circle, right? Mm -hmm. So A is equal to pi r squared. And that probably is the hardest part of it. Like you have to know some geometry sometimes. And so you're like, if you have to Google what the volume of a sphere is, Google what the volume of a sphere is. I'll give you some equations. I probably won't give you the area of a circle. Like you probably have to know that one. Okay. And then third step is take d dt of both sides. So the derivative of a equals the derivative of pi r squared. And once we're at this step, it's a lot like the previous problem that we just did. What's the derivative of a? It's just da dt, right? What's the derivative of pi r squared? Mm -hmm. And times a dr dt, right? Because again, the last problem, we had to add both dx dt and dy dt. Same thing, they're just a's and r's instead of y's and x's. And then now, can you use this information to find dr, find Mary Kate doesn't like it. It's because this variable, that t, didn't match the r variable. Okay. Ah. Huh? Okay. Good. Okay. And then now step four <coughs> is to use your given information, info, to find what you want. Do you know what I mean by that? Do you know what DADT is? No. Do you know what, are you given a specific R that you care about? Yes, what is the R that you care about? <coughs> Four. And are you given a, a DRDT? Yes. yes, and it is one. one. And so that would be eight pi. eight pi. And it would be, in these questions, I do want you to give me units all the time, feet squared per second. Let's give a sentence. The radius, or no, sorry, not the radius, the area is increasing or decreasing? Increasing. increasing. At 8 pi square feet per second. I know like dropping pebbles in ponds seems like a stupid application, but what about the expansion of an oil slick? Because that could be approximately circular in, a still, in still water, right? I mean, it gets more complicated. That's why life is messier, right? It gets more complicated if you're in like a moving ocean, but it does kind of go and expand, right? And then the affected area gets larger and larger and larger. <coughs> so that's a, sort of an idea that where this could kind of come up in a more realistic situation. Okay. Air is being pumped into a spherical balloon so that its volume increases at a rate of 4.5 cubic feet per minute. How fast is the radius increasing when the diameter is 4? Okay, so my step one is to find the stuff you're given and find the stuff you want to have. So volume increases at a rate of 4.5 cubic feet per minute. What is that? D V D T, because of the fact that this units in the bottom are time, that means it's D time. So D V D T is 4.5. That's what we're given. What do we want to find? DR. We want D R D T at the point when R is equal to, here's where they got a little tricky, 
They got a little tricky. Two. Yep. Just watch out for stuff like that, right? Diameter four means radius is two. Yes. And think about blowing up a balloon. Like if you put a balloon like on a helium tank, it kind of seems to get bigger really fast and then kind of slowly, right? Have you ever watched a balloon being blown up? Does that make sense? That's because when you add on a little bit of radius and your balloon is bigger, you have to add a lot of volume to go around the whole thing. Versus initially, that lots of all adding like you know a little bit makes it get larger faster. Okay, what was my step two? Get the equation. So does anybody know the volume of a sphere? Mm -hmm. R cubed. It's okay. It's I mean it's a formula I didn't memorize either. I would I would give you that one on a test, like the AP test I've seen. Give it to the students. Um, it's you think that. Um, it's three-dimensional, so you have to have three variables. That's why the cubed. So that would be the helpful thing. Whereas area is square dimensional, so there's R squared. And the volume is always cubed. Yeah, and there, but there's also volumes of like cones where you'd have like it's one-third pi R squared H, but you've got still three dimensions because you've got two in the R and one in the H. We'll have an example of that next. Okay, so can you get the derivative of this? I'm going to be kind of lazy and want to do it fast. It's going to be dv dt equals 4 thirds pi, and then what's the derivative of the r cubed going to be with respect to t? Mm -hmm. 3 r squared dr dt. Very good. And so dv dt, just simplifying slightly because if you can cancel stuff, you should. 4 pi r squared dr dt. We already briefly discussed the fact that the change in the volume is like adding a surface area, right? That 4 pi r squared is like the surface. It, it is the surface area formula. Okay. So now can you plug in the information that you know? Where does the 4.5 go? In for DVDT. I was just kind of curious. Why didn't we just start writing that in step three? We could have. You, uh, um, you can't plug the numbers in until you've gotten the derivative. Does that make sense? Oh, because you're taking. Okay. Yeah, otherwise it'd be like the derivative of a constant, which would be zero. Equals four pi times two squared dr dt. So I'm going to write 4.5 as 9 halves. This is going to equal, I think, 16 pi. Actually, let me not do that and tell you how to deal with it, because I think you might not come up with that on your own. So 4.5. So how do you get the dr dt by itself? You divide by 16 pi. Okay, that's 4.5 over 16 pi. It's just kind of bad math grammar to have fractions and fractions, which means decimals and fractions are kind of also icky too, right? <coughs> so does it make sense that if you're at this stage, you could actually just multiply by 2 over 2 and then make the 4.5 into a whole number? Okay, so that'd be 9 over 32 pi, right? Mm -hmm. And that pi is in the denominator, so make it totally obvious that it is down there. Does that make sense? Because you divided by it. And then what are the units on this going to be? And I said, look up the D, dr. r is radius it's measured in the top. Okay, what is the radius measured in? Feet. Because the volume was measured in cubic feet, right? What was the time measured in? Yeah. Minutes. So is the radius increasing or decreasing? It's increasing at that rate. Okay. All righty. Is the next one about a pint? No, but it's, it's a conical tank. Okay. So water runs into a conical tank at a rate of 9 cubic feet per minute. The tank stands point down and has a height of 10 feet and a base radius of 5. So this is what this looks like. Its height is 10. 
I don't know why they call that the base radius, but they call that r equal to 5. I don't know, these problems always make about make me think about being in Minnesota at harvest time because they had these things that they collected corn in that look like that. They're like funnily shaped things. You can think about it as a really, really big snow cone. Okay. So water is being poured into this thing. So we have some general height and some general radius. <coughs> Um, the height, you want to know about the rate of change when the height is 6. Kind of like on the previous question when you wanted to know about the rate of change when the diameter was 4. You can't use that information until you've gotten your derivative. And that is a really common error with these kinds of problems. They try to use information too early. So don't use any information until you have your equation you have your derivative. Okay. So let's first figure out what rates are we given. Water runs into the tank at a rate of 9 cubic feet per minute. That's what your flow rate Uh-huh, which will be, in terms of the volume, will be dV dt. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're given dV dt is equal to 9. And I'm just going to give it a label so it's totally obvious. Um, you want to figure out how fast the water is rising. Is that dr dt or is that dh dt? That's going to be dH dt. And you want dH dt when h is equal to 6. But don't plug in 6 too soon. OK. Step two, is everyone OK with the rates we know, rates we want? And actually, like on your quizzes, I'm going to give partial credit this way. If you can find the rate you know, find the rate you want with proper units, so you can get a point for each. If you can do nothing else, that you get that. Um, what is, so I don't expect you to remember this, but the volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h. <clears throat> and the slight issue here is this has too many variables. So uh, you can't put 9 in for B because 9 is actually dV dt. Okay, so here is the, this one has a little bit of a trick to it, okay, and here is the slight trick. You use similar triangles to get rid of R. And I'm going to draw a flattened version of my tank, OK? So 5, 10, Generally, you're probably you're pretty much always going to be doing something like this when you come across a problem where you have more than one variable. It's just that you maybe you're also given information in such a way that you can do this without similar triangles. But do you see from that expression there? I can say that r over h equals five over ten. That's just super basic geometry, right? And so therefore, r over h is equal to a half. And that means that R is one half H. Do you buy that? <coughs> and then you can take that information back to your original equation. And plug it in for R. So pi thirds one half H, the quantity squared, H. No, because they end up taking a long time, right? It's the first, uh, there are not, I think that there are only four or five homework questions, and this is the only lesson we're doing today. 
Okay, so like when I give you a quiz, I'm probably going to give you, okay, just push a button on that watch, just any button. Okay. Um, when I give you a quiz, I'm going to give you like four questions. But once you get the idea, it's actually not that hard, because once you get this little similar triangle step, that's it. So bef do you want to use the product rule? Can you avoid using the product rule? Yes. How can you avoid it? Oh, God, no. Even easier. Pi thirds, one quarter, h squared h. Pi twelfths h cubed. There's the equation you got to take a derivative of. Algebra. You see what I'm saying? All of a sudden it became super simple. I just squared the one half h, right? And then I was multiplying stuff that had common bases, exponents add, yes? <coughs> so now what's the derivative going to be? dv dt equals pi over 4. Yep, do you guys see how we got pi over 4? Because he took the 3 down and then he reduced the 3 over 12 times dh dt. Or dv dt equals pi over 4 h squared dh dt. Say that again. Now you can put a little stuff you know. So step four is to input the stuff you know. Yep, so you knew that dv dt was 9. Which h did you care about? Was it 6? If you look at the question, was it h equals 6? I believe it was. So times 36 dh dt. Can you reduce that 36 over 4? Mm -hmm. So 9 equals 9 pi dh dt. So 9 over 9 pi equals dh dt. What is dh dt? Mm -hmm. 1 over pi, and its units would be, what are h's units? Uh-huh. Per, was it minute or second? Minutes. Minute. You see what I'm saying, though? So in general, that was the all three of those examples that we did involved some kind of geometry, right? And they kind of got harder as you went. Does that make sense? This is kind of the hardest geometry-like thing you're going to see. I okay, think like I did that progression on purpose. I do recognize this one is harder, but it's not. As long as you don't, like, blank out on exponent rules, right, which could happen. I've seen it. Just, just think, can I simplify this, like, easily? Don't, no log differentiation needed. Okay. It would work, but it would be disgusting. I'm not saying it. Now, this also involves geometry, but it involves the Pythagorean theorem. So a ladder 12 feet long rests against a vertical wall. If the bottom of the ladder slides away from the wall at the rate of one foot per second, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the bottom is six feet? So you have your wall something that's kind of triangle-like. Where in the triangle is the ladder? The hypotenuse is 12. And it's going out this way and down that way, right? And the sides that have arrows on them, is it clear that those are changing? As in they're not constant, so I'm gonna give them variables. I'm gonna call that one X and call that one Y. You can call them whatever letters you like, but I'm gonna pick X and Y. Okay, so can you get an equation that relates, so actually we'll do the given thing. So what rate are you given? DX dt. Yes, dx dt, and that's equal to 1. We know that's positive because the x side is getting larger as the ladder falls down. Does that make sense? If we were given dy dt, we'd have to note that it was a negative number because that y side is decreasing, right? Okay, what do we want? Mm -hmm. It's 
specifically when um, y is equal to, nope, not y, when, what is equal to 6? Is it x or y? I think it's when x equals 6. Okay. Now the equation we're going to use is x squared plus y squared equals 12 squared. And do you accept that that's an equation that relates x and y together? Okay. Why can I plug in 12 right now and I shouldn't plug in 6? What's the difference between 12 and 6? 12, 12 is a constant and doesn't change. The latter's length never changes, right? Whereas x is changing. Since x is changing, don't plug x in until you've got the derivative. Okay? Could you have another style of problem where maybe you have like an extending ladder and it is changing? Yeah, yeah. Or, or pro we're going to do problems where you have like two cars going at perpendicular to each other and there's a distance between them is changing. Mm -hmm. Yep. But in this case, if something, the only, you can plug <coughs> it into the equation if it's constant. Does that make sense? That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, take the derivative. So d dt of this side equals d dt of that right side. So what's the derivative of x squared plus y squared? 2x plus 2y. Two, almost. 2x two dx dt plus 2y dy dt. How about 12 squared's derivative? There we go. What's the derivative of sine of 2? Not an unrelated question, but it was on a quiz. Zero. It's zero. I keep trying to trick you with tricky constants. I know. OK. All righty. Now, now you can plug in your information, right? So 4. Oh, crap. Shiznits. Okay, we're going to plug in for x. We'll have 2 times 6 times 1 plus 2y dy dt. Why did I say crap? We don't know what dy dt is. That's okay. Yeah, that's expected. What about, we also need to know y, right? Hmm. So, could you figure out y? You know x is 6, right? You know that you've got this Pythagorean theorem relationship between these numbers, right? So you find y using the fact that x squared plus y squared is 12 squared. So 36 plus y squared is 144. <coughs> y squared is, oh God, 108. Is that right? I think that's right, but you should stop me if it's not. So what's y equal to? I'm pretty no. sure it's 108, yeah, because of the whole carrying business. So y is root 108. Does WebAssign make you reduce radicals to get full credit? Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't? Okay, that's one way WebAssign is better than Alex, right? Okay. So now, can you figure out what dy dt is? Uh, you can simplify that down to 6 root 3. Mmm, good. Because it's 36 times 3? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now plug that in. So you have 2 times 6 times 1 plus 2 times 6 root 3. dy dt is equal to 0. Now can you get dy dt by itself? Yeah. So first I would take away 12. 2 <coughs> times 6. Actually, it's 12 root 3, isn't it? 12 root 3 dy dt equals negative 12. So I think that dy dt is just going to be negative 1 over root 3. And it's going to be feet per, was it second or minute? I think it must be second. And does that make sense of what you think is going to happen in the context? Is y, as x changes, is y decreasing? 
yeah, as the ladder goes away from the wall, its height above height on the wall decreases. So that is why this number came out to be negative, as it should. Okay. So if you had sort of realized that you needed the y for your eventual answer, you could have found y in the beginning. But if you're sort of new to you, you might run into the end and be like, oh crap, I also needed y, and then okay, how would I go find it? But now that you've seen that, yes, you can find y right away. Okay. A street light is mounted at the top of a 10 foot tall pole. A woman five feet tall walks away from the pole along a straight path at a speed of five feet per second. How fast is the tip of her shadow moving when she is 40 feet from the pole? Okay, so you have a street light. And then you have a lady. She wears dresses because, you know, that's what ladies do. Just kidding. Okay, and she's walking away from the pole, right? <coughs> so we're having this kind of situation going on. We'll give her zoom lines. So she can move forward without moving her legs. That would you ever walked in a skirt? Probably, obviously not. Okay, so <laughs> ten foot pole. That's the perfect <laughs> I'm just, I'm just <laughs> ten foot pole. Um, um, five foot lady. Okay, and she walks at a speed of five feet per second. So this, that's how fast her um, walking is changing. I'm going to call that. I'm just saying very close. I'm going to call this x. I'm going to call this distance y. And I'm going to call this total distance S. Okay, so first of all, does it make sense that the thing that we're given is that dx dt is equal to 5 feet per second? We're told that. And what we want to know is we want to know, I'm not even, I didn't review this enough to really. We want to know dy dt. Does that make sense? Because how fast y is changing is how fast her shadow is changing. And actually, I don't think you even need that S thing. Do you? Or is you it part of her shadow changing, too? Hmm? You need X of 40. You need X of 40, yep. So what's an equation that relates x and y together? Well, I can see that s over 10 is equal to 5 over y. Mm -hmm, but that would, that would be not help, be helpful because you know, you, you, don't, you know about dx dt. Does that make sense? So then you wouldn't be able to use that information. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so what I would say instead, and how about, how about instead of using s, we say that, because your idea is kind of, so tell me again what you said. Uh, S over 10 equals y over 5. S over 10 equals y over 5. Can you guys buy that? Similar triangles. So S is this whole base, 10 is the height, right? Y is this bit, 5 is that bit, right? Okay. So can you make S instead of X's and Y's? Sure. Uh-huh. Just by saying X plus Y over 10 equals y over 5, right? Yes. All right, so there you go. Now we're good. Now we're in business. There's our equation. <clears throat> 
And um, just to make things have whole numbers, can I say 5 times x plus y equals 10y? Um, well, you don't really need to, you don't really need to get rid of the fractions, do you? It's just kind of nice to get rid of the fractions. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. All righty. So then take the derivative. The 5 just factors out times the derivative of x plus y equals 10 times the derivative of y. So that's going to be 5 times, and actually, heck, couldn't you even get rid of that 5 and say that this is instead 2? Okay. So what's the derivative of x plus y going to be? What's x's derivative going to be? dx over dt. Mm -hmm. What's y's derivative going to be? Mm -hmm. Equals 2 times dy dt. Uh huh. Yeah, actually, so dx dt is going to actually equal dy dt. Do you guys agree with that? Because what we just did is took away a dy dt from the left side to the right side and combined like terms. So, and here is the thing that this problem is a little bit funky. You want to find dy dt. You plug in what dx dt is. Yeah, and that really isn't the trippiest part, and because that, that's a coincidence because of how I designed the problem and the way that I made the ratios. But the thing is, you didn't use the fact that x was 40. Does that make sense that that's, we didn't actually use that? There's no more x's in the equation, right? We took the derivative, and the x's derivatives are 1 dx dt, right? That, that happens very rarely, and this is one of those instances that you don't actually use that information. You were going to say something. Without using derivatives, you can also find the similar triangles that x equals y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then you would use the x somehow. Yeah. But the thing is, in this situation, there's no reason it would be x squared, right? I mean, in the situation where you're looking at shadows and movements and stuff, it's yeah. So anyway, there's that's what dy dt is, and I don't think that's actually how fast her shadow is moving, because this is a little bit of technicality, but the shadow's movement is also affected by her movement, right? If she moves faster, her shadow moves faster. Does that make sense? So the shadow's length is x plus y. So you have ds dt is equal to dx dt plus dy dt. And so in this case, that does happen to be 5 plus 5 is 10. Feet per it was a feet per second, I believe. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is that those two numbers might always not always be equal. That was a coincidence with how I picked the numbers in the problem. If the pole so had been your, taller, shadow at 20 feet. doesn't matter. Same speed. I don't think so, though. In real life. Yeah, I think it is in real life, and this kind of proves that that's true. But we'd have to go out and confirm it by measuring. But it, I think it is the case. Unless you're so that's what this is saying. I mean, there's. It's one of those instances where the rate of change of your shadow is constant. No matter, it's the same no matter what x you're at. So yeah, that's weird. It's not what I would have expected either. Okay. <coughs> okay, a police cruiser approaching a right angled intersection from the north. This is where you get to decide that I'm directionally challenged. Okay, police cruiser coming at it from the north. Okay. Is chasing a speeding car that has turned the corner and is now moving straight east, which I'm pretty sure is that direction, right? Okay. Never eat soggy waffles. You guys ever heard that one? Yeah, of course. Okay. When the cruiser is 0.6 miles north of the intersection and the car is 0.8 miles to the east, the police determine that the distance between them is, the, so the car and the car they're chasing, is increasing at a rate of 20 miles per hour. 
if the cruiser is moving at 60 miles per hour at, at that instant of measurement, what is the speed of the car? So um, in math questions, when they say distance, they are very specific. They mean straight line distance, like as the crow flies, so to speak. So the distance between these cars is this. Never mind how they measured that because, you know, we are concerned with math problems, not with real life. Just kidding. Okay. So what rates are we given? I'm just going to call that Y, I'm going to call that X, and I'm going to call that Z. This time that side is not constant. Okay, so what rates are you given? DZ over DT, yep, what's that? 20. You're given one more. Mm. D, DY DT. I made Y my vertical side. And there's one tricky thing here. You have to say negative 60. Why is that the case? because it's moving down towards it, so that means the y side is getting smaller. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the one tricky thing in this question is if the side is decreasing, that rate has to be negative. Say that again? Uh-huh, when, um, I think that means y is 0.6. But are you okay with the rates, Mary-Kate? Is that part okay? So dz dt is how fast the distance from the cop car to the car chasing, that's the distance from here to here, that's increasing 100 miles an hour. And then how fast this y is changing, that's d at y dt. Okay, now what we want to find, we want to find the speed of the speeding car, right? That's dx dt. And specifically when, okay, the cruiser is 0.6 miles north. So that means that... Which of those is 0.6? Why? And the car is 0.8 miles to the east, which means <coughs> x is 0 0.8. Does that make sense? Okay, what's the obvious equation relating these, these guys together? Mm hmm. And you can use this info to find z, can't you? So you'd have 0.6 squared plus 0.8 squared equals z squared. Without a calculator, what is 0.6 squared? 0 0.36, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, Somebody made this math problem nice because that's 1 equals z squared, right? Somebody, not me, your textbook did. This is, means z is equal to 1. Okay. <coughs> now take the, take the derivative of it. What's the derivative of x squared with respect to t going to be? x squared's derivative is... Mm -hmm. 2x dx dt plus, what comes next? 2y dy dt equals, nope, derivative of z, 2z dz dt. You can't plug in what z is equal to yet, just like you couldn't plug in the 0.6 for y or the 0.8 for x yet. just because it will make the arithmetic a little bit easier, is it clear that we can cancel the twos? Okay, so you've got x dx dt plus y dy dt equals z dz, I should say dz, dt. <coughs> and once you're there, let's just plug in everything that you know and find what you're missing. So do you know a particular x that you care about? 
I mean, that x is 0 0.8. Um, what is dx dt? I think we don't know that one, do we? No, so dx dt we don't know. Do we know why? Mm -hmm. And what is dy dt? Negative 60. Okay, equals 1 times 20. So 0.8 dx dt. I think that will be minus 36. Do you guys agree with that? Equals 20. So 0.8 dx dt equals 56. You buy that? There are some instances in life where, I mean, I don't like dividing by decimals. It, it makes me nervous. I prefer to change this into 8 tenths. Because then I can... It does, it's just 70, but it, made, it, makes me, it just makes me nervous. I, wonder, I worry about decimal places and things like that. Does that make sense? But so this is 560 over 8, or like you said, it goes in evenly at 70 miles per hour. So unless that cop increases his speed above 70 miles per hour, he isn't going to catch that bad guy. Well, they could also put out things to make him, like, you know, lose his tire pressure, which would decrease his speed. Okay, I think there's one more on there, am I right? One more, okay, all right. So, the last one, so those are just kind of the examples we've had have been like geometry, <coughs> Pythagorean theorem, right? This one has a little bit of trigonometry in it. So a hot air balloon rises straight up from a level field and it's tracked by a range finder that's 500 feet from the liftoff point. So you have your person and you've got your balloon and this person your range finder is 500 feet away and the balloon's going up and you want to figure out what angle do you have need to have that range finder at to keep that balloon within the sights of your camera So I'm going to call this side Y, call this side Z. We're not going to need all the sides. Okay. So, and you could have, of course, drawn that picture sort of just a reverse image of what it was. It doesn't really matter. The question's the same. At the moment, the range finder's elevation is pi quarters. The angle is increasing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute. So what rate is that? What, are we, what is that? I don't think that's right. Look at its units. Mm -hmm. It's d theta dt. It's talking about how fast the angle is changing. d theta dt is 0 0.14 radians per minute. Look at the units and say what's measured in radians. It's the angle, not the y. The y would have been like feet per minute or something like that. Okay, what do you want to find? You want to find how fast the balloon is rising. What is that? Mm -hmm. You want dy dt. And specifically when theta is pi quarters, right? <clears throat> So you do have options, like you could, for example, I don't know, you can use whatever side of the triangle you want, but does it make sense that using the side of the triangle that has like an actual constant number is better than the ones that are two variables? So use a trig function that relates the y and the 500. Tangent, yep. Tangent of theta is y over 500. 
Okay, and I'm just going to say 500 tan theta equals y just because I don't know fractions anymore. Yay. Okay, so now can you take the derivative of this thing? What's the derivative of tan theta going to be? Secant squared theta and then times that whole d theta dt because you have the whole different variable business again equals mm -hmm, equals dy dt. Okay, are you now capable of plugging everything in? What goes in for theta? Pi over 4. So I am going to, in the same step, write this as 1 over cosine pi over 4 squared, because I can't do secant without thinking, okay, secant is 1 over cosine. And I'm going to make d theta dt into a fraction, because it's going to make some of my big numbers cancel. So what is 0.14 as a fraction, an easy fraction? 14, 14 over 100. Okay, so in the numerator, I'm going to have 5 times 14, which I do know is 70, but, you know, just in case. See where I got the 5 from? What is cosine of pi quarters? Root 2 over 2. Nothing squared. So 70 over what's root 2 over 2 squared? I think it's one half. Do you guys agree with that? Because root two squared is two and two squared is four. Two over four is a half. Yeah? Okay. How many one halves are in 70? 140. <coughs> so dy dt is 140. And I think its units would be, what was the y measured in? Was it feet? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Per. Mm-hmm. There you go. So the balloon is rising at a rate of 140 feet per minute. Now, I want to make one comment about this problem. So what if, this is just a what if scenario, What if you had um, a situation where for some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, this side was the variable and that side, okay, what if you, what if you had that situation, okay? Which of these would you choose? Which equation do you think is best? Would you choose tan theta equals 100 over x? Or would you choose cotangent theta equals x over 100? Can't you change cotangent into cosines and sines? I mean, like, really? Well, yeah. Okay, so think about this. Why, why would the first one, I claim the first one is worse. Okay, and here's the reason. If you take the first one, Okay, so take number one, take tan theta equals 100x to the negative first and take the derivative. It's going to be secant squared theta d theta dt will be negative 100x to the negative 2 dx dt, right? How about this one? What's the derivative of cotangent squared? Mm-hmm d theta dt, right, equals 1 over 100 times dx dt. You see that? So it, it won't be wrong to do it this way, but you just have to find some way of figuring out what x is, which might take some work, versus 
this way, even though you don't have a cosecant button on your calculator, you can say, okay, I know cosecant is one over sine, right? And you can go from there. So just be, it's easier to keep the variable in the numerator if you can. And just see if you can use a different trig function to make that happen is my point, okay? All right. <clears throat>